Welcome to Future Web, episode five, everybody. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, sorry for the late start. Uh, there were actually a few accidents on the bridge, and I apologize for that. But we have a very, very, very awesome agenda for you guys today. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, there we go. And uh, and uh, just so you are, for the ones who are just joining us and haven't seen any episodes of Future Web before, um, this is a show where we kind of discuss sort of the, just a very futuristic thinking of how we think sort of the next six to 12 months will pan out on the web and sort of angle it on more on the entrepreneurial side and have people who are, you know, sort of discussing things that, you know, as you have may have noticed from our general uh, demeanor are a little younger. And so we sort of take this angle that I think will probably add to some of the discussion. And we uh, are very excited today to be joined by Nina Kosla, uh, founder of TT, and she will tell you more about it. Um, so everybody say hi to Nina. Hello. Hey, Hi, guys. How are you? All right. So, Daniel, kick off the agenda. Yeah, so uh, I'm Daniel Ruslovsky. I'm the uh, founder of Teens and Tech Labs. Uh, unfortunately, Joey, who's uh, our third co-host, is not with us today. He is actually in New York, uh, but he will be back for the next episode. Uh, so we just wanted to say that really quickly. But we first wanted to get to know Nina and ask her a few questions and find out who really is Nina Kosla. So, Nina, let's uh, let's hear a little bit about you. Cool. Well, um, I grew up here in the Bay Area, and I started a company called Teethy. I'm fresh out of school, mostly. I st studied What does that mean, mostly? <laughs> it means that I'm mostly fresh out of school. So you, the Our, paper is there yet? Or the, paper, the paper is there. Ah, the paper, so, good. Yeah, Got the it. paper is there. So you've, you've graduated college? Yeah. Good. Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Good, good. Okay, yes. Um, but we will dive into TT, yeah. so, so yeah. we will ask you more questions about okay. that in a bit. Cool. Yeah, and I, my background is in design, and I grew up on the web. So. Awesome. Cool. And and just so you guys know, and yes, it's, it's a sort of, we'll just say it, her last name is familiar because, yes, her father is Vinod Kosla, but that is not the reason why she's here. She's here because she's awesome. Yes, and we actually had a lot of questions about that. Um, because for, for me, uh, my parents, I know Brian's uh, story is a little different. Both my parents work in tech companies, and so I grew up around tech. Brian, your parents aren't quite in tech as in working in no, the tech industry. No, my mom is a nurse, and yep. my dad is an accountant. There you go. But your parents are, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know about your mom, but your dad is pretty well known for being the, the founder and CEO of Sun. Um, how was it growing around tech, and you know, was that a, a big influence in you starting uh, Teethy? Um, you know, it was funny. I actually grew up around a lot more sort of experimental tech. So when I was very young, I, you know, the web was just coming online and there was a lot of experimentation around that. But uh, as I sort of got into high school and college, a lot of the innovation in the Valley was centered around, you know, clean tech and things that follow more in that sort of larger scale. So less about web real. and more about like things that will impact the planet. Right. <laughs> and I think okay. that's been, you know, a huge Garden. influence because yeah. I think uh, in Any the solar? last... What? Any solar energy or stuff like that? Or yeah, solar energy, everything. everything. Yeah. Um, biotech, You were everything. the first to drive the first model of the Tesla Roadster? No, no? I was not. Okay. You wish uh, you were. You, you, I, I have wish been, I was. Uh, I have been almost run over by multiple experimental vehicles on nice. Stam Stanford campus, but that was much later. Nice. Um, yeah, I, I think in the last, you know, two to three years, there's been a huge push for essentially the productization of the web. And that's really awesome, but I think that what we're ending up doing is kind of releasing similar product after similar product after similar product, as opposed to really thinking about how we can take these huge discontinuous steps. Um, and so it's definitely something you get inspired to do. Yeah, with. yeah and I think this has been a, a big issue in Silicon Valley is that there's you know, 400 iPhone apps doing the same exact thing, and yeah. innovation is starting to get a little bit lost. Well, I will throw it back to you then. I mean, we haven't actually asked you what Teethy is, so... Yeah, so what why is Why don't you Teethy? tell us more about Teethy? Okay, and I would Is it that interruptive tech you're talking about? Right. Um, you know, uh, Teethy is focused around communities. I, As I said, I grew up on the web, and I grew up blogging on the web. When I started blogging, one of the things that... You know, blogging was really about actually finding other people like you and developing a community of people that you 
sort of shared a passion and an interest with. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I really wondered about was how do we how do we bring some of that feeling back into what's going on on the web today? So 10 years ago, the idea that I could publish some, something on the web was insane. People loved that they finally could put what they were saying out in a public a forum. Yeah. Yeah. But at this point, you know, we're not just content to push something out into the web. We actually want to know that people are listening and people are paying attention to what we're talking about. Yeah. And I think that one of the problems is, is that in general, software hasn't really followed in that space. And so I think that in terms of the next big innovation that's going to happen on the web, it has to be in the social space and it has to be about fostering these really deep, passionate interests. And I do believe that's going to come in around communities because that's the way we sort of interact with our passions is through the communities of people that are actually practicing what we're doing. Got it's it. kind of a coincidence that Joey isn't here because his company, Backplane, <laughs> yes, a lot of they're, they're music doing a community lot. And, yeah. that. and But I will sort of, I mean, to, to frame things more tangibly, I guess, for people who are watching and also for us and sort of a reference point. I mean, have you have you had a product launch yet? Or are you still in right. concept phase? Like, where? So, so we're actually testing yeah. right now. We're testing on a small group, an alpha group. Yeah. And uh, it's been going well. We've been working on something really unique and I love Different. it how you didn't call it beta. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in terms of, is this, if I were to mention the, the N word, Ning, Ning actually, not yeah. the other one, <laughs> Ning, would, what would you, <laughs> is, uh, what would you say to that? I mean, how would you, I mean, I know probably people mention that because that's been, right. that was the first sort of mass execution of what we think a community uh, sort of aggregate network would look like, but I'm assuming yours is different. I want to hear how right. that's going to be different. Well, I think that Ning, um, is actually very different uh, because they weren't actually doing real communities. You know, when I talk about communities, Ooh. I mean... Okay, go ahead. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, because Ning described themselves as a space for creating your own social network. Um, people thought of these niche social, social networks as communities, but they're really not. Communities means that, you know, you have groups of integrated people, there's an a hierarchy to them, people know each other, and there's sort of some shared interaction and some shared sort of experience that in makes me part of the community or not part of the community. And I think that that is um, super important for uh, for when we talk about one of the widening might have not been as successful as you can they might have I think it like got loose and started sinking down. <laughs> yeah, okay. You probably want to tighten it, yeah. One of them, one of the knobs. Something like that. There you go. Good. Oh, there you go. go. Good. Maybe? Do you think? Yeah, probably not. I don't know. Okay. Maybe. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Mike. I'm going to keep messing with it yeah. and hope that it just uh, fixes worry. itself. Yeah. Okay. So you, you say that the shared, the shared experiences that make you feel like you're part of it, you don't really think we're there with Ning. No, I really don't think we are. I think that one of the things that's going on with Ning is that... This is, it's become a space for data transfer, the web in general. You know, I put things out into the web and I hope that other people find them interesting. Yeah. But one of the things that defines our sort of participation in a community is actually sort of knowing all of it. Yeah. So not just what I'm interested in, but what the community as a whole wants to talk about so and the what they want to view talk about. Almost. Exactly. Got it, got it. And you guys think you have the formula for that. Yes, I, I hope so, or we're at least on the path to discovering what that is. Do you think you're going to be more about um, information and reference, or are you going to be more about simply sharing, or is it going to be a combination of the two? Um, you know, I think that the way to think about what we're doing is we're really focusing on conversation, because Got these it. conversations make up communities, and I think conversation is sort of a different exper experience than pure information, and I think it's different than just pure sharing either. Got it. When do you hope to, to launch TC? Um, you know, I think that depending on how things go and if we sort of feel like we've reached something that works for people, I hope we launch this summer. And let's create a community around FutureWeb. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's do absolutely. Hopefully we can be one of the, the first... Um, <laughs> One of the first big communities on, on Tithi. We want to ask you a few more questions. You mentioned that you, you're big into design. Um, what inspired you to really get into design and kind of, you know, who have been your, your mentors and influencers around that? So it's, it's funny that you should ask that question. I actually um, started my obsession with design in middle school. 
And one of the avenues that I used for exploring design was through the internet. I, um, you know, I was 12 and (laughs) not a lot of other kids were interested in picking apart, you know, Adobe Photoshop or learning HTML and CSS and kind of picking apart those types. Did you pay for your first version of Photoshop? You can admit. What it. kind of question is that, Brian? I, just, I, I, I openly admit that I didn't. So <laughs> I can't confirm or deny. Uh, oh, there okay, we that go. means no. Okay, yes. Cool. Very cool. I, no, seriously, I don't remember. Yeah, that's all good. <laughs> um, were you like more? What? 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 Drew, like, were you more um, uh, art like, or were you more UI like, or what? What? What areas of design did you dabble more in? You know, I started out a lot in the sort of graphic design art side of things. Mm. But, um, Painting or you know, I did, illustration? Or I did everything. Yeah. I did a lot of illustration. I did a lot of web stuff. Photo manip? Yeah, photo yeah. manip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Look at you using yeah, just shortened just, words. Yeah, just I, I've <laughs> never heard that before. Photo manipulations, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Thanks, well, man. the shortened version. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and I was definitely interested in that at the beginning of, you know, when I first fell into things. But as I kind of gained more experience, I started really being interested in design as a whole um, and spent, you know, when I graduated from or failed to graduate from high school, I, uh, I, I fell in love with sort of industrial design and I thought that that was what I was going to go into. So I spent the uh, first two years of college designing around physical products and I realized that I didn't really enjoy it. And I realized that, you know, when it comes to interaction, one of the things that I, one of the things that I really fell in love with, with design was this ability to create these incredibly rich social interactions. And when it comes to physical products, you can kind of only design what, you know, a group of people can sit in front of. So maybe you design a table and maybe you get to call that a design. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or a billboard or a beer pong table. Or yeah, mm. but when it comes <laughs> it's a social to, thing, man, come on, it's very okay. social. It's really social. <laughs> but when it comes to the web, you know, you can get start designing on a much larger scale than that, yeah. and really thinking about sort of what people want from experiences, and that's yeah. what I fell in love with, and it just so happened that I, you know, spent all my time on the web anyways. So do you have yeah. these philosophical conversations with your dad as well? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like you think about this a lot. I, I think really about shows. it a lot, yeah. but, uh, you know, there's a lot of really interesting people out out in the Bay and, you know. Uh, and you interned I, at IDEO, too. I interned yeah. at IDEO, yes. Uh, the IDEO guys are really fantastic. For those of you who don't know, IDEO is, like, the world's most, like, ridiculously cool, like, just... I mean, what do they call themselves? Like, a d- the design, design agency? Design, design, nah, firm, yeah, it is something, but they basically studio. make a lot of things that you would have not expected a, a company that has designed as a, its own thing. Like um, A lot of extremely creative people. I mean, the only one I can remember right now is like, you know, the Peak devices, you know, the ones yep. that were single use. They designed that, stuff like that. Kobo Reader. The Kobo right. Reader, as you guys may have heard, was acquired by like, was it Ren Ren in Japan or something? One of the big Japanese companies. But anyways, Kobo is an e-reader and they designed the first version of the actual physical product they like that. actually designed the first apple mouse that's, incidentally that's how Sorry. they got their, I, yeah. their more modern start. examples you yeah um but going going back to a little bit uh going on brian's question i mean obviously your your dad is a, is a huge figure in kind of the technology industry and you you had to be kind of around a lot of people that mm-hmm. you know growing up was that a huge influence are you and like are, are those people kind of still mentors to you in a way um, you know, I, I found that when I, as I've grown up, I sort of found my own mentors and found people that I, I really connected with, which is something that I've been incredibly lucky to do. I think that the biggest difference, um, the biggest thing that that allowed me to do was essentially to, to learn from a very early age that it was possible to have a huge impact on the world. And, you know, since you figure that out at a very early age, you know, one of the questions that you ask yourself is, okay, what do I have to do in order to be the type of person who does change the world and who does have a major impact on what the, you know, on their fields and what they're trying to do? 
so that was that was definitely a different frame of thinking to and even a lot think. of people admire you know those who just do want to make that impact almost no right. bullshit right and that type of thing is really important for all of us right. to see and we're excited of what you're creating and i think um you know do you have any specific names of people that you spent a lot of time with that that uh um you know i that's probably i i think you know in general though the people that had sort of a huge impact on my life were really you know my parents and my friends and my teachers and those kinds of things that those are the guys who really really spent the time and really you know made an effort that showed up in in what I do today got it's it awesome Talk. well thank you so much for joining us um TC hopefully uh we'll talk about it when it goes live um, we'll get a community set up. Yep, we'll get mm -hmm. a community set up. Everybody but, uh, get super close to all that. There you go. Uh, but now let's let's move on and uh, to our next segment, uh, which is in the last episode we talked about South by Southwest and kind of what to expect and, and some tips. Brian and Joey were going. Were you and at South by? I wasn't at South by. But you South were the previous years. Weren't I you? was Isn't the that previous where we met? year. Yes, it was. Yes, I remember now. Yes, yes. it was. The it's a little one. bit blurry, right? But yeah, it's dude, I was, back. what are you talking about? It's totally sober, very clear. Uh, but anyway, so now that Brian, we're all back, how was South By? Um, it was ridiculous. Um, I think the, the common theme across everybody sort of describing that weekend, for the, so South By is divided into interactive and music and sort of a whole series of things. But for the interactive section, uh, there was a lot of rain, unfortunately. And mm. during most of what would be would have been sunny, you know, 95 degree weather where people would be walking around with barbecue um, and being really happy was basically ponchos and hunkering down inside and being really depressed. Uh, thankfully, it cleared out near the end. But I think I would say sort of a few themes kind of emerged from the conference itself or the, 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 the sort of the festival. Um, one was sort of this 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 general theme of, of just absolute insane amounts of noise where not just obviously the loudness of everything but I'm talking just too many things to pay, be paying te to attention to people people were just finding it very hard to find one thing to get it's excited like five about. parties every single night and these are like big brand parties it wasn't just five I'm talking dozens of parties right yeah. and they would pay for everything from booze to food to it's just it was people were there performers. I think less, performers yeah. it just got insane and so I think that again like everyone of these events where a lot of value was extracted which a lot of people either complain about or feel very excluded from are the more um, sort of more uh, tight-knit sort of uh, uh, after party private party type of yep. things and and uh, I although I do feel that there was a great way for people to interact and the panels were great and things I think I think there was a, a good theme that came out of uh, the, the conference overall yeah and I think as someone who's been to South by Southwest in previous years and this year I followed it online instead of Kind of uh, in the offline being present, I think in a way it's it's like you said, there's a lot of noise happening, both digital noise and kind of real noise. And I think being able to take a step back and take it in at the speed that you want to take it in. I mean, companies, everyone talks about Highlight. That was one of the big companies that launched out as uh, or was big at South by Southwest. They launched a little bit before that. Now you haven't really heard too much about them. And well, I what's think fascinating is even when it was hot for serendipitous location discovery, people apps, Glancy just got acquired by Facebook. Um, I I remember you know sort of the the uh, Andrea who's the the founder of, of Glancy. He was being really kind of antsy at face uh, at South by. I think I had a hunch that he, something was about to yeah. happen. Um, but I think there was sort of this. Uh, it, it only lasted for the four days, and then blah. You know, and, and, and then they, it's back to reality. Back to reality, where I, like I don't think there's any other like scenario where a concentrated amount of people would add to the utility of what the guys were trying to accomplish with the serendipity model of, of these 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 apps. But I do feel if we talked about something more general and useful, I think for discussion purposes is. The notion of serendipity is incredibly um, sort of uh, sort of growing as a trend that that's embedded in sort of the functionality of applications, right? So radar is one application where Facebook, I mean, uh, Foursquare applied it to what they were doing. Yeah. I think location aware is one aspect of serendipity. There's other things like sound awareness or a proximity to people, proximity to businesses, proximity to, to individual verticals that matter beyond simple location context. That's what I feel is going to become incredibly, almost giving you that sixth sense. 
Yeah. That's what we started to realize was very apparent out of what happened at this conference. But I think it's going to take a few more years until that becomes actually, you know, a real thing that people and grandma can start talking about and actually use. Yeah, and I think it ties into a lot of what Tithi is doing around communities because I think a lot of what happens at South By is there's these communities of people who get together and, like, you'll hang out with these people and you'll see them over and over and over every single night everywhere you go. And it's, I think, South By, it's great because it's that middle point between New York and San Francisco where everyone gets together and just has a good time and celebrates technology and innovation and, and music and film and just culture in general. And I think it's one of those events that if you, if you have the opportunity to go, you definitely should go at least once. Why did you opt out this year, Nina? Um, you know, I I opted out because... I felt like it, it was pretty crowded last year, and I, I think maybe I would have gone if it was a little bit easier just to get it set up, but it was such a mess, and I kind of looked at it and decided rather just stay and build. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that... It just became too much of a hassle to even get there, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's tough. You know, I think that one of the problems is is that as you start to get larger, you do see fracturing, and you do see, you know, you kind of wonder... Um, wonder if that cuts down on our ability to really interact and meet new people in the space. You're right. There's yeah. a lot of noise. And I think on, on the youth side, just to sort of mention that, I think I, I saw a absolute sort of critical ma I feel like there's a lot of them. And and, and yeah. there were parties that just were dry, and there were parties that, that had alcohol, and I think everybody had a good time. But I would turn, like, just everywhere I turned would be someone with an app, someone who was yep. extremely young-looking, someone who clearly wasn't supposed to be at that party but was somehow and yeah. i think that was just it's just not novelty anymore yeah. keep and in mind a year ago that was you sure and <laughs> i'm not saying that's a bad thing i'm just saying that it's become now less of a novelty it's become more of the norm um is to see you know you know i mean the the volume of emails i get on a weekly basis now from people who are under the age of 20 that are creating applications or companies who want to learn and to grow has become it's it's almost hit a fever pitch yeah um and it's not a bad thing i'm really really happy about that because that's kind of what we wanted and i think that's what you had built with over at teens and tech and i think um will continue to be built as a legacy as people continue to to grow and as you get older too absolutely and and just to note if you are interested in going to South by Southwest next year, it's Friday, March 8th, 2013, and it ends on the 12th, um, and that includes interactive and music and, and a, whole, uh, a whole wide variety of the activities that go on there. And I think you mentioned apps, which is a perfect segue to our next segment, which is Planet of the Apps, where we talk about some of the new apps that just launched and our take on them. And, uh, and the first one is uh, Cinegram. Have you, have you seen Cinegram? Yeah, I think it kind of popped for a bit, and then it kind of just it flattened did. Out. Yeah, they were featured on the App Store, um, and their whole thing is they're they're going on that uh, on the whole Instagram craze. And I'm sure if 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 you've been on the internet, you've seen that Facebook acquired Instagram for a billion dollars, and Instagram just lets you take a picture, add filters, make it social. Cinegram did something. Uh, Beyond that, not only can you take a picture, but you can also animate it with animated GIFs. And so you can take a static image, as you can see on the screen right now, that's a static image that has animations in it now. And I think uh, it's The way it works, by the way, just so you guys know, yeah. I'm probably, I mean, I don't, has, has any shows on Twitter talked about it? I'm sure there's been some mention of it, but basically you take a picture or take a video, you'll like highlight an area that you want to have just concentrated in animation. You can do some cool stuff and basically loops in infinity. Yep. Um, have you used it? You know, I have, and yeah. I, I think it's a neat space. There's a lot of really cool photographs and people that have innovated in this space, and I'm really excited that we're starting to see more of that. Yeah. It's a cool art form. Yeah, and some celebrities have started jumping on it. Adrian Grenier of Entourage has been posting a lot of stuff. He's been posting a lot of stuff on Instagram and Cinegram, which yeah. is interesting. Let's mention, actually, Cinegram and the theme of a few other apps that we actually yeah. have here because they can all be grouped together. We've got... Social cam and Facebook camera. So well, let's talk about social cam first and and Viddy because yeah. those both. I think both everybody of those are here has probably space. heard of both those apps, social cam and Facebook camera. Really quickly, social cam is Instagram for video. Facebook camera is a competitor to Instagram that the company that just acquired them decided to create, which made no sense to me. But I think <laughs> the neither. theme that I do want to talk about is sort of this rapid adoption of sort of this Insta sharing. Yep. Nina, you seem to be. Have, have a lot of thoughts around social, right? So I would love yeah. to have your take on this. Why so, do you see this trend? On the youth side of things, you see 
sort of this adoption within our generation being much more rapid than anything else. Um, and what does that mean for businesses? Um, you know, I, I think that we're still exploring this space. I think this is why we're seeing so much, so many of these apps come in and so many of these apps very quickly die off because we don't know yet what this space looks like. Is it um, even a space, though? You know, it's, it's an interesting question. I think that the right, the right form, if in the right form, it would be the right space. So One the of the form things will, will, will dictate it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is so interesting okay. about this space is that actually, you know, photos have been one of the, it is Facebook's core product, really, yeah. photos. Um, and part of the reason is, is because when we want to translate our real world identities and sort of represent ourselves online, doing that is sort of best done in photos. Yes. But now that we're moving to these InstaShare applications, it means that I can't just show the one party I went to on Saturday night on my profile and look like I went to a bunch of places. It pushes me to be updating constantly. And I th think one of the, the questions is, is if that really actually fits with people's lives. It certainly fits with a bunch of influencers, but for everyday people, I'm, you know, I... It's a tough question. And it's, it's a very a good question. Yeah. And, your, and your point about Insta sharing sort of giving you this um, not only capability but almost expectation, right? Right. Because it's like I, I like, perfect example, and, and this is the most basic, but like Twitter, of course, was kind of the beginning of all of the, I mean, in many ways of all of the sort of the micro-sharing dynamics mm -hmm. we're seeing right now. My mom, if I don't tweet for more than like seven hours, will freak out and like call me and be like, are you dead? Like, are you okay? <laughs> and it's just like, it's funny because the expectation of something that's real time is that you also share in real time. Right. Um, and it's almost discouraged to go back, right? It's right. almost like when you first load these things, it's like you have to take the picture now, not right. look at something from the past. Right. Um, it's very interesting. Right, and I, and I think that, you know, there's a bunch of interesting things that we could do around there. Um, but we so far have kind of focused a lot on the same paradigms over and over and over again. And I guess, you know, as we think about this, if we think about new ways to of imagine what sharing would look like would be really, really super interesting. Like, like um, the Google Glasses? Like Google Glasses. Are they calling yeah. it Google Glasses? What are they calling I th it? Yeah, I think, the, I think it's called Google Glasses. Okay. It's part of Google X, I think is the name of the yeah. cool innovation thing. They should have called thing. it Goggles. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, and again, you know, one of these questions yeah. is... Yeah. is yeah. Yeah, sorry. Goggles. <laughs> sorry. Um, is, is whether the whether we're comfortable with that level of sharing. I think that one of the things that people mistake about youth now is that they think, okay, well, kids don't have any, or kids these days don't have any expectations or don't have any sort of, re they don't have a realistic view of privacy mm -hmm. and, and that they don't care about it. And I don't actually think that's true. I think that a lot of people now and a lot of the younger generation has kind of reached this point where they understand once they put something online, it's sort of online and there's no expectation that it should be private. So Facebook having privacy settings is really great if you think that what you put online can still maintain its sort of selected group of people. Yeah. But I think a younger generation just honestly doesn't believe that. And I think that they just say, all right, either I'm going to share it and I'm going to share it with everybody or I'm going to keep it to myself and keep it to my friends and keep it offline. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely correct around the fact that it's not that we don't care about privacy. It's that we understand more about the implications of what it means to have something out there, right? Right. Because, I mean, the reason why that transition was so difficult for folks from the older generations that were trying to get used to these things was, oh, you mean so when I put it there, like, it's like now my identity and it's now part of, like, what people are going to use when they f do due diligence on me. And it's just like, it's, 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 uh, it's a it's a, a learning curve that w most of us were born with, um, rather than needing to adapt to. Um, and I, I think also like I mean I don't hang around a lot of teenagers, but um, I think in terms of <laughs> sorry, uh, but You're I that think what I've old, observed, Brian. I, yeah I know I'm like old fogey, but I have observed though that um, that there is much more uh, adoption right now of messaging one-to-one -one messaging. There's a reason why WhatsApp and you know, I, I message and all these things are blowing up um, 
because of the fact, and even even more private yeah. things like uh, pair and uh, and others, is because I think the the cyclical need of a closer interaction, I think for for the younger generation, is actually even more uh, apparent right now. It's actually kind of ironic. It's right. it's pretty cool. Well, and you know, I think that one of the things that we we've been kind of fooled into thinking with the sharing paradigm is that somehow if I put information out there, it's kind of out there and that's it. But there's actually, there's something to be said for sort of sitting you down and saying, hey, look, this is what happened to me and showing photos or whatever I want to do or however I want to tell that story. That's very different than putting it on my Facebook profile and saying, hey, go check it out. Um, and I and I think people really crave that that sort of connection that arises from these one to one and you know when you get to these group texting applications these you know many to many interactions. Yeah, a, a few uh, days ago I was actually at Pixar um, for for a small event and I took a lot of pictures and I and I didn't post it up on Facebook and later that night I. I took my iPhone out and just showed the pictures to my parents. And that's, I think that's a more emotional experience. And really it, retro, dude, Daniel. It's yes. very retro. retro. It's like old style. Exactly. Yeah. But I think, you know, I, I agree with you, Nina, that it's, it's, it's kind of like a lost format almost right. with, you know, with us being so digital. It's like you, you listen to yourself, like, and, yeah, just well, like, you know, just uh, <laughs> manipulating the photo and zooming and pinching is like so old. But the, the fact that I'm sitting down, I mean, I do this with my grandmother. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, take no, out yeah. my iPad and I show her pictures of our family that she hasn't been able to see in a long time. And it's like she doesn't know what the Internet is. You know, she's almost 90 years old. She's never used a computer. But when I put an iPad in front of her, she took it out of my hands and started swiping. And she started going through the photos herself. And I think that kind of interaction and that kind of touch where you see it in person, you see and you have that emotional connection. I think that's, you know, that's what we're missing out on a lot. Right. That's awesome. Uh, and I think we want to highlight one more app. Yep. Uh, or two more. One two is more. called Get It Now with Postmates. Unfortunately, it, it's San Francisco based only. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, there we go. But, um, hopefully, but hopefully you guys get a chance to, to play with it. Nina, have you ever used... Get you know, I haven't, but my co-founder used it. Okay. Um, and it's Danny, why don't you give the brief overview? Yeah, so uh, Get It Now, basically, uh, the name kind of speaks for itself. Uh, through an iPhone app, you're able to, through a wide variety of, uh, of locations, you're able to say, I want something from the Apple Store, and a courier uh, will go and get it for you um, through, Basically, you know, it's Uber for runners. Exactly. And if you <laughs> haven't heard of, of Uber, Uber yeah, is sorry, a, <laughs> it's of, a, yeah. a black car town service uh, that you can get through your uh, iPhone. It's not a, a town car service. Town car service. Yeah. There you go. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things that really fascinates me with this trend uh, is um, the laziness that's being propagated through applications in general. <laughs> like it's just, you can't. You want something, go walk and get it. But like we're starting to see people literally like, oh yeah, I could go to like the Apple Store or Powell, whatever, but um, I'd rather have a Postmates guy go get yeah. it. Um, it's interesting, but I think the service will take off. Um, and I think it already kind of has, right? Yeah, yeah, I think they've already done over $100,000 worth of transactions just through the app, and it was in private beta uh, just in San Francisco. I think they're going to be launching another city soon, but it's just – an app that uh, I think is pretty cool, and hopefully uh, some of you other guys will be able to, to try it out. But then our last app, Speaking which... Speaking of collaborative consumption... Yes. Um, there's another app that recently was announced. It's still in beta. Um, hopefully, we'll be outside of just San Francisco as well. I just hope you guys don't hate us for just mentioning San Francisco <laughs> stuff, but this stuff is usually really cool, and people love using San Francisco as, like, the, the test bed. But uh, it's, a, it's an app called Lyft. It looks exactly like Uber. Uh, but it's from a company called Zimride, and the concept is simple. Instead of black, expensive town cars, it's other people driving cars, just anybody. Uh, not anybody. I mean, I, I should rephrase. People that they've had background checks on, but the yeah. concept is simple. Carpooling is a very age-old format of transportation. Um, still has existed, still exists today. Uh, but why not have the ability to carpool with a random stranger um, that is – you know, has been vetted. So that that's the concept. And the, and the rates are 75% uh, that of taxi rates. So it's cheaper than taxi rates. So I think wow. one of the biggest appeals for this will be cost. Um, and I'm very excited to see what happens and how many lawsuits end up getting launched from this. <laughs> um, but I'm very excited about it. Cool. 
And so we're going to jump into our last segment, um, which is a new segment that we're doing, uh, which is called Problems You Didn't Know You Had. And this is more focused on startups and entrepreneurship and things like that. But if you've been following the news lately, uh, there's a company called Square, which is based here in San Francisco, that does uh, mobile payment processing. Following the news means the news within the Silicon Valley bubble. Exactly. Go on. Yes. Um, Square lets you uh, take credit cards from your iPhone, iPad, Android device, um, and they're uh, actually one of the founders is uh, Jack Dorsey, who's one of the uh, founders of Twitter. And so this company has had a lot of um, uh, a lot of success. Uh, actually, Brian has a Square reader on his uh, on his phone right now. If Face we can shot. Bring, if we can, Thank there you. it Damn. is. There we go. Um, and so there's been a lot of drama at Square lately. Uh, there's a site called Quora, which is a Q and A site. <laughs> We're using so um, many Silicon Valley yeah, services. so many Silicon Valley. Describe services. everything that's happening here. Okay. Go ahead. Um, anyways, uh, there was a, a post on Quora is uh, Square an unpleasant place to work, uh, and there's been a lot of posts on here basically saying, you know, they make you work late and, and things like that, and so it, it got us thinking about company culture. <laughs> they make you work late. I'm so sorry. That's a really bad thing. Um, no, I, I think a general theme here, rather than just addressing Square. And Nina would love your thoughts on this because you're building your startup now. How many people are at Teethy? Uh, we're just four right now. Four? Still yeah. small. Uh, dude, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but I think it's having this conversation. I mean, this is perfect for you because it's like the early, you know, days. And and are you the CEO or? Um, I, I like to call myself the chief fan girl. Okay, so at <laughs> CFG, and as the CFG. Uh, um, you know, there's a lot of things you're gonna have to build um, when you grow, and I mean, I'm I'm sure you're excited about the challenges ahead. Um, uh, if you weren't, you wouldn't be doing this. Um, but I think <laughs> tackling sort of the, the the general issues that a lot of startups, when you first hear about this stuff through TechCrunch, so a lot of the audience, I think, um, is sort of a, you know tech interested, reading a lot of publications, we see a lot of glitz and glam, right? Like, ah, oh, this person got funding, millions of dollars, blah, 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 blah. But actually doing it <laughs> is extremely hard. And yeah. there are things that I hope when you guys are building your companies, don't just simply glance over and ignore. And the first one is 100% um, sort of employee retention and satisfaction. Um, and Square was sort of like this first PR debacle around it. But I think there's much more to it. So, Daniel, you've, you've managed teams. You've led a team. Mm -hmm. uh, Nina, you're doing the same. What are some sort of tips that you guys have around sort of making sure that just people are – are, are not dissatisfied. Yeah, I think one of the, the biggest ones, um, especially in teens and tech's case, because we have people all over the, the country, is communication. And I think it gets lost uh, the bigger you get. You know, when you're four people and you're all in the same room, you know, you can just say, hey, Nina, I have a question, and you can start a conversation. But when you have people in New York and Boston, and I'll keep, Brian, your company, you have offices in like three countries, um, I think communication is a, is a huge uh, problem. Uh, so how so do you solve that? We use a tool called HipChat. HipChat. Which is you mentioned a, it before. Yep. Yeah. Which is a group chat uh, tool. Other than tools, what sort of sort of cultural yeah. sort of fundamental things occur that allow you like what, you do weekly meetings? Like how we you do. do yeah. So one yeah. of the things is we try to we we try to do video sessions on Skype as much as possible. How often? Uh, we try to do once every other week Got with it. everyone. Everyone. Um, I talk to our CTO who's in New York uh, every day and about over once Over Skype or, or over the phone? Uh, over everything. We text message all the time. Oh, that's cute. Um, Sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. We, yeah. we hip chat. We Skype. I talk with uh, another one of our guys, Greg, in Boston and over so text So regular message. meetings, regular schedules. Regular communication. Bi-weekly for team. To, I'm talking about yeah. structure specifically because it... You mean how big is your team now? Uh, four. Got it. And so you're similar. So how do you... What's your, your schedule structure like? Um, You know, we also... Being small, we don't necessarily have as many troubles with communication, but we do make sure to do kind of weekly meetings um, where we all sit down and we look at the week ahead. And we we try to stay in touch in general. You know, I think that it's really important to sort of have methods for collaboration. I think that, you know, being a designer in tech is particularly difficult because there aren't a lot of great sort of precedents that you can follow and learn about for how designers should be interacting with technical teams. So how, what do you do? Um, we, right now, uh, we break up our, our, our sort of 
interactions a lot. So when once we've decided on what we're going to do, and we'll have conversations about those things, but after you know I sit down and I start designing, we kind of have a very specific process for breaking that down and making sure that everything that I kind of want and that I'm thinking about is communicated to the technical team in a way that they can sort of implement that right away. Is this through email? Do you do it on a whiteboard? Do you yeah, we cut use, out pieces of paper and lay them on the table? So, like, so we use Pivotal Tracker. Hmm. Um, and one of the things that I love about that is also that you can see what people are working on. Um, and I actually, you know, uh, my co-founder has been great in um, in really setting up that process. And one of the things he suggested is we actually keep two different trackers. We keep one for uh, for the technical side, so for development, and then we keep a separate one for product. And a lot of times the product one has a lot a lot of different stems of ideas growing in it as we start to think about what the different features are or what the different steps are to implement that. Is product less frequently updated than technical? Is that kind of how you divide them or is it a different dynamic um, altogether? You know, uh, again, because because I'm doing a lot of the product myself, it's it's very mixed. I tend to use I tend to use that tool as I've kind of decided what I want to do, and now I'm thinking about how that thing should be implemented. Got it. Because when I'm going to school and studying product design, I learned a lot about the design process, mm -hmm. but you don't learn a lot about how to communicate that process yeah. to other people. That's just something you have to learn about. And so I really, you know, stuck to this great, amazing process, influenced, of course, by IDEO, um, that I... And this process yeah. is? I, I can happily talk about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, do. you know, with, uh, with the IDEO process of design, we call that user-centered design. And we focus on really spending time understanding the users of our product above and beyond, you know, before you even have any sort of idea of what you're going to design. So actually, when I started this product, um, I, I started thinking that there might be something in the space of communities. And so I spent six months before ever kind of drawing, putting anything to paper in terms of wireframes or anything else. You know, I spent six months just doing research, doing interviews and reading and sort of lurking on different forums and trying to figure out what was going on in the space for real people, not just for the companies that were trying to innovate in that space. And I think that that time really enables you to think differently about problems because you've spent the legwork. Um, Did you give any nicknames to these users that you were looking at? I like <laughs> Communal Sally and, <laughs> you know, and, and, and posting Harry or whatever. Like, I mean, like, uh, how would you look at it? Um, you know, I didn't give nicknames, but it's <laughs> not uncommon. I, you know, those are great ways to kind of sort of share the essence of users and what they're thinking about. Um, but for whatever reason, I, I So didn't. which user did you see that you really related to that was what you designed Teethy around? You know, I think that there's a whole group of people, you know, going back to this question of Insta sharing, um, that this whole group of people who grew up sharing or who have started, spent the last few years sharing little snippets of information. And I think that what they're discovering is that they have something more to say. So they say to themselves, okay, I really actually have more to say, so I'm going to go and start a blog. I get this question all the time. I want to start a blog. So they start a blog, and then they put up, you know, they spend a half an hour or an hour putting up this intricate post that they've written and really thought about, and they put it up, and nobody reads it. And, then, <laughs> and they never update it again. And they never update it again because nobody reads it. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I think that there's a real need there that just isn't being addressed. Got it. Good longer form communication. That was actually really interesting. No, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Some, some really good insights in there, and especially, I mean, because IDEO is 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 really a thought leader, I think, in the innovation design space. It's it's really interesting hearing a lot of those kind of ideas and strategies. And so, thank you for sharing that. Yep. You're totally welcome. <laughs> and it's fascinating around the user because it's so obvious, but just people just don't do it. 
and it's sad sometimes because you'll see products that are clearly not designed for the user, um, yeah. and one of them may or may not be sitting right next to me on this armrest. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, but in, in terms of sort of a keep, and we're a little different of an animal because we're we, we're a little older as a company. We're about twenty months old now. We're at thirty people. And we have an office in New York and in, in, in Chicago with one dude and um, a guy in L.A. And then um, the, the headquarters is in San Francisco. And then we also have a, uh, our rep in, 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 in London. And what we do on our meeting mix is, is it's actually more elaborate now. When we first started, it was weekly. Now it's Monday mornings we have an executive team meeting um, before we have an all hands. So we have sort of our uh, core group of execs that just we just spend time tackling high level issues for the week. So we all know what's going on, at least on deals that are active, um, employee issues, um, competitors, environmental things, um, you know, uh, financials, all sorts of things. And then right after, what is appropriate to share with sort of the entire uh, company in terms of what would fuel a lot of cross communication properly, we sort of do really quick tidbits. It's a 15 minute all hands, and everybody dials in from all different countries and go like, is is is, is the UK in? Is US in? Is Colombia in? And then people are like, yeah 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 yeah, uh, <laughs> and it's awesome. And then we do that, uh, and then um, right after that, on the same, so Mondays are all basically meeting days for us. We don't try to take up too much time. But right after that, the the the, the individual teams. Um, um, they, 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 they go into their own updates. So the BD team goes into their own scrum. The sales team goes into their own scrum for about another hour. And then the, basically the morning of Monday is just everybody now knows what's going on and goes crazy. Um, and uh, throughout the week we'll have various um, sort, of, uh, sort of things. Me, especially now, being, uh, you know, it's, it's, I try to have as much face time with everybody as possible. So I have at least, I'd say, 10 to 20% of my time on a weekly basis Either in one one on ones with employees, or sort of uh, sort of spending time in groups, um, at least tackling a big project, or sort of figuring out how we can sort of put ideas to paper of something that we know is a big issue we need to solve. So there's a lot of things that end up happening, but that's sort of our communication. And we use Asana, by the way, for our main mm. um, communication, I guess, tool for productivity. We just started using Trello. Trello. We, yeah, it's it's um, it's from the same guys. Uh, I'm forgetting what they, they made, but they're a company. Oh, Fog Creek Software. The same guys from Fog Creek Software, they made Trello, which is a, uh, it's basically a, a to-do list, but we, we have it set up for uh, projects and things like that. And it's it's collaborative and we have multiple people on it and they can rearrange it based on order and things like that. And it's it's actually worked pretty well for us. Uh, considering it looks have exactly people. like the the cardboards carded boards you use, basically in retro style organization, you'd have like you know what's yeah, being yeah. worked, you know what's well, ideas, what's being worked on now, what's in the future, and you have these little post its and everything. And it's kind yeah. of like a physical version of it. Yeah, um, or a virtual version. Yeah, let's talk about uh, a few more things before we wrap up the show. This is actually an issue you've been going through over the last few months that I constantly get emails from Brian saying, "Do you know any good PR firms Not just or me, PR dude, people?" It's everybody. <laughs> um, Hiring a good PR firm is actually getting pretty hard. I actually think it's more difficult to raise. Uh, to, to, it's it's less difficult to raise money than it is to find a good PR firm right now. Um, I think um, PR in general, though, I do want to mention. I mean, it's different stages again, but in general, PR and launches is highly misunderstood by startups. Highly, it's like people think it's getting an article on TechCrunch. It's not. It's a lot of things that involve sort of getting grassroots uh, acknowledgement from um, sort of tastemakers in your space, which is basically a very fluffy way to describe you reaching out to bloggers and individuals, influencers, your influencers yep. um, that I think will most likely be part of these communities in many ways too, to sort of add content and add value through sort of their 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 gravitas, uh, and 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 sort of you know sort of. Understanding what's relevant to you beyond the, the simple TechCrunch post, I think, is incredibly important for a lot of startups. And I wanted to ask you guys, and sort of just PR in general, like how have you? I mean, Daniel, you're you're very lucky in your background. I don't know if you guys know this, but Daniel uh, used to work at TechCrunch. He 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 knows a lot of reporters and PR people in the ecosystem. So you have no trouble getting press. Um, but what is your strategies? And, and and Nina, what are your strategies? I'd love to hear. Yeah, I think the the biggest thing is. And a lot of companies overlook. They think like, oh, we raised you know a million dollars. That's worthy of a TechCrunch article, and that it's a huge misconception. And I think it as as someone who used to work at TechCrunch and write about startups uh, almost every single day, 
what I looked at was a unique story. I, I wanted to, to see something unique about a company. And when, you know, Brian, when you were first starting Keep, your angle was that you were 19 years old and just raised, you were the youngest person to ever raise VC funding. That is an angle reporters want to talk about. And I think a lot of companies, you know, they're doing the same. This goes back to something we started off with at the beginning of the show, which is innovation and things like that, that a lot of people are doing the same exact things. What's going to make me want to write about an app that does the same thing just because they raised a million dollars? And I think... You have to have a unique story, a, a unique angle, because you have to sell the writers at these... Angle. Huge. Yeah. So that, I'd say yeah. the, the sort of way to wrap that together would be, you know, you need to figure out that angle. What's unique about it, right? Yeah. And use what you have, right? In many yeah. ways, people forget that they have something that's really cool, and then they go with the what the cool kids do, right? They, they go, oh, they're trying to get a celebrity. The celebrity has nothing to do with your product, okay? Go do something that's relevant to why you are unique, not why some dude's using your thing that makes it so special. Yeah. And I think just, you know, that, that whole angle is really key because that's what pulls people in, that emotional connection of I can relate to Brian because Brian is, you know, a year and a half older than me. And I'm like, oh, if Brian can do it, so can I. That kind of mentality and that kind of, you know, emotional connection, that's what gets people excited. For the reporters, that's what drives page views, yeah. which drives, you know, advertisers and things like that. Nina? Um, you know, it's funny. I actually have thought about launch a lot differently. Um one of my big questions is not sort of how do we get press, but actually how do we get the right users? Because I do think that, you know, right now a lot of people are just worried about getting the right, getting users onto the system. But we're starting to see a lot of these crashes happening where lots of people sign up and then they don't really have a product that works for these people and so they drop off. And I think that for us, we're really focused on let's find communities and people who want communities that don't have a space for it and try to get them onto the system as opposed to you know people who who want another platform to talk about themselves yeah so, yeah. That's so not what, really who, what who do you about. think that may be and how can you find that person you know we actually started out we're starting out very simply we're starting by reaching out to people who have communities or have you know have um sort of Groups of people that want to form communities. Yeah. What's a tangible example of that? Uh, you know, I'm a big San Jose Sharks fan. Go and Sharks. So, yes, yes, go Sharks. Yes, I am too. Sadly, they didn't. I'm a Canucks fan, so I will not comment. You're from go Canada. Ahead. Yeah. So, oh, goodness. So. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> go on. Yes. Okay, anyways. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I started by reaching out to a lot of my, my friends and the community that I formed in that area. Uh, and I hope hope that we'll be able to get a lot of the you know tech people and design groups onto onto the product. And Are you saying going it. straight to like the NHL and saying like uh, we want no 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 uh, just going to going to regular fans. You know, if you look at Twitter, the the hockey community is huge on Twitter. They they really are active. And Very passionate. Talking passionate and they're yeah. talking so like, to each you know, other reaching out to people on twitter then or are you saying hey join this community like blah. um no okay. no i you know I, again how do I you get them to join is what i'm asking like i mean theoretically it's great that there are people that exist but are you going to yell right. from the the stands and say we've right. got this community go right. to blah 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 tv dot com or something right well you know the first step is just starting with the people that i know and the people that i that i i have my own community around and their call to action would be their call to action would be to join TT and check it out and got you know it. really give me so still to great join feedback. TT then yes, right got right it. cool you know join it and I'm trying to set it up so that you know when they sign on they find other people that they know and people talking about the things they want to talk about so that they actually have a real reason to stay. Got it. So do I go to, to sharks.tv.com or something, or how do I join this thing? Because I want to. Well, it's wanna, still. Uh, it's, I want to troll your, your forums. <laughs> it's still in a private can alpha. Can I not troll it, please? I, I can give you I can give you an invite and let Love you it. troll it. I will at troll it. Love it. <laughs> well, I think um, that almost wraps up the show. We have a few announcements. Brian, like you mentioned, uh, Keep is growing quite a bit. You're actually hiring even more. So tell us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, I don't want to make it too self-serving, but um, we uh, are looking for uh, quite a few people. We're, 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 uh, our job board is at jobs.keep.me. Uh, um, and uh, if we kind of use the, the line, are you a keeper? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
and uh, there's just a lot in, in both San Francisco and New York, and, and uh, we welcome everybody from across the country. I think a good chunk of our team is actually not from San Francisco. A lot of them have moved in, and we will pay in many cases if you are really that amazing. So uh, I encourage you to not apply. We, I don't like the word apply, really, but it's more like if you if you know you can really you know add some value. and Step you, up you, to the challenge. Yeah, and you're really, really, yeah. really good. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you. Yeah. Um, so feel free to reach out to me too. I mean, I'm at Twitter at, at, at Brian underscore Wong. Yes, I got, uh, I, I did not get the one without the underscore in the middle. <laughs> so just don't give me anything for that. But yes, so try to, to reach me out there. And then my email is at Brian, Brian at, at keep.me or Brian at keep.com actually. We actually recently acquired that domain. So congratulations. Thank you, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Yep. And then a uh, quick announcement from us at Teens in Tech. Uh, on Friday, we announced that our 2012 Teens in Tech conference is happening August 9th in uh, Redwood Shores at Oracle's headquarters. Uh, Adam Debrazini, who is a the head product designer at Keep, is actually going to be one of our speakers. And they say the valley is an incestuous. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. But uh, anyways, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you're going to be around, you should definitely join us. Um, so with those two announcements, we really want to thank everyone for joining us in the chat room. We want to thank our amazing producer, Liz, for running the board back there. We want to especially thank our guest, Nina Kosla. Nina, where can we find you online? You can find me, you know, at... At Nina Kicks, N I N A K I X, and you can check out. I have a website at ninakicks.com. I think that works. Do you really <laughs> kick? I I try. I try every is it day. Kick something or is it kicks? It's just K I X. Okay. There you go. Oh, ah. No, I I lied. You can go to ninakosla.com. There okay, you go. Good. Um, and then I'm at Daniel Brew on Twitter, uh, DanielBrew.com or TeensandTech.com, and then Brian, you're Brian underscore Wong. Wong. Yeah. Keep.com, mm. BrianWong.me. Uh, this has been the fifth episode of Future Web. Thank you all for joining us. This will be hopefully on uh, YouTube uh, very soon. Thanks again to Twit, and uh, have a great weekend. Cheers. Bam. <laughs>